One of the main storylines in the lead up to the 2022 Formula 1 season was that of the new Mercedes driver pairing. As we know, Valtteri Bottas was rarely a threat in terms of competition to seven-time world champion Lewis Hamilton. So when it was announced that George Russell would be replacing the Finn, it sparked debate as to whether he would be able to step up to the plate or not. Some predicted that he'd outperform Hamilton, whereas others thought it would take a couple of seasons for him to get up to speed. I personally believed the latter, and I have to say, I've been proved wrong. I've made a few videos on Russell in the past, covering topics from his journey to Formula 1 to that famous night at the Sakir Grand Prix. And every time I've come to looking at his performances in detail, I'm impressed more and more every single time. His stint at Williams was difficult, but ultimately character building. It laid the foundations for the George Russell we're seeing in 2022. As it stands, he is the only driver on the grid to finish in the top five in every single race so far, which is mighty impressive when you consider how difficult the Mercedes has been to drive. I'm sure you all know by now that these new F1 cars all suffer from one main problem, porpoising. And for Mercedes, it was their performance killer. Their car, in theory, could be a lot faster if they could run at lower ride heights. But that's a very big if. Since lowering the ride heights increases the severity of porpoising, there comes a health risk as the driver's bodies can't sustain that level of bouncing for a full race distance. In addition to this, there's also the risk of damaging the car. Therefore, there needs to be a compromise. It's weird, because when you look at a team like Ferrari, for example, they are experiencing similar levels of porpoising to Mercedes, but still have one of the quickest cars on the grid. However, the main difference is that the F175 is more pitch sensitive to porpoising, whereas the Mercedes is more speed sensitive. In other words, the Ferrari's porpoising is only triggered when there's maximum load being exerted on the rear, but settles down much faster under braking. In contrast, the Mercedes porpoising is triggered when the car crosses a particular speed threshold. Therefore, if they're above this threshold through high speed corners, then the car will continue bouncing, making it much more difficult to control. This was most evident at Turn 9 at Albert Park, where both Hamilton and Russell were forced to drive below the limits of the car, to prevent it from flying off the track. But now, with the upgrade introduced at the Spanish Grand Prix, their porpoising problems are mostly solved. In the words of Mercedes strategy director James Valves, the Mercedes was a proper racing car. They could tune it, set it up, and play around with settings such that it would respond in a predictable way. Now they finally have something they can build from. Although they are worried that their issues might not be completely gone, the situation is a lot better than it was in the opening five rounds. George made great use of this upgrade by delivering his second podium of the season in Barcelona. And yeah, it wouldn't have been possible if Leclerc didn't retire, however, it was still a tremendous performance nonetheless. The inspiration for this video came from the first stint of the race, where Russell was defending Verstappen, and what I was most impressed by was how well he handled the pressure. The first proper attack came when George moved over to defend, and Max sent a late one up the inside. But as he was carrying too much speed, and at an acute angle on corner entry, it allowed George to follow the racing line and regain the place. Going through the long right hander of turn 3, Russell was firm in his defence, by running Verstappen out of road on the exits. The next time around, Max attempted to go around the outside with DRS, but once again, George managed to fend him off. This particular battle was a perfect demonstration of keeping composed under pressure. Although he didn't have as much to lose and could therefore defend a bit harder, it doesn't change the fact that his wheel-to-wheel -wheel skills are up there with the very best. As much as there's been a lot of hype around this guy, there's also been a lot of skepticism, and understandably so. I mean, with all due respect, Nicholas Latifi isn't the kind of teammate you'd exactly be proud to beat, even if it was convincingly. Another reason why some people weren't fully sold on Russell's potential is because Williams was a much lower profile environment. There wasn't as much pressure or expectation to deliver consistently good performances. Considering he's entering a new team, with arguably the greatest driver ever as his teammate, in a car that's been unbearable to drive only until recently, you wouldn't expect George to be performing this well. And it's testament not only to his immense talent, but also his maturity. Back in January, before the season had even started, he said adaptability is what makes a great driver, knowing what the car is capable of and what the car isn't capable of. And it's clear to see now that his sentiments have aged like fine wine. For the first race in Bahrain, he didn't have the best qualifying results, as he could only manage P9 and a little under a second slower than his teammates. Given he was quick throughout both Q1 and Q2, it was pretty odd as to why he was so much slower in the final session. Well, in the post-quality interviews, he explained that he tried pushing harder on the outlap to get the tyres closer to their optimal working range. But instead, he ended up overdoing it and was left with no grip. But in the race, he was much better, bringing the car home in P4 after Red Bull's late double DNF. It was a similar story in Jeddah, but once again in race trim, 
The Mercedes was much more competitive, relative to the midfield that is, and he came home in P5. His first podium for Mercedes came at the Australian Grand Prix, where he managed to jump both Hamilton and Perez under the safety car. In Imola, he was able to catapult up from 11th to 9th off the line. Then came the incident between Sainz, Ricardo, and Bottas, which allowed Russell to sneak up to P6. On lap 12, he made a nice pass on Magnussen for 5th, and from there, he inherited 4th after Leclerc's spin. Overall, a great comeback drive, but most of his places were made up due to others' misfortune. Miami was another tough qualifying session once again, as he didn't make it into Q3. However, on Sunday, he made it back up to P5, after another safety car helped him overtake Lewis, who was on a much older set of tyres. Then came the Spanish Grand Prix, where he was absolutely flawless in his defence against Verstappen and delivering another podium for the team. And in the latest race in Monaco, he extended his streak of top 5 finishes to 7 by jumping his fellow countryman Lando Norris in the pit stop phases. Briefly summarising George's first 7 races for Mercedes, it's clear to see he has been clinically consistent and made the most out of others' misfortunes. He hasn't really had an off weekend yet so far, and I don't think you can say that about any other driver. Yes, he's had a couple of poor qualifying performances, but he's made up for them in the races. And that's been a very common trend with the W13. They seem to have quite a peaky car in quali trim. They've struggled a lot to get the car set up in the right way and getting the tyres into the right window. Even the slightest shift in approach to an outlap can be the difference between making the top 10 or not. Now though, the Mercedes isn't as unpredictable as before. Therefore, we can expect to see them fighting with the Red Bulls and Ferraris on occasions throughout the year. Based on what we've seen from him so far, he's more than ready to take on the likes of Verstappen and Leclerc up front. The only area I'd say he can improve on is his race pace. When both he and Hamilton have both had representative qualifying sessions, there's been around a tenth of a second difference between them in favour of both. Sometimes Lewis will have the upper hand and other times it will be George. However, on race pace, Hamilton is the one with the slight advantage, but has suffered more bad luck than his teammates. Taking this into account, we're yet to see Lewis put his best foot forward this year, so it will be interesting to see how the dynamic progresses during the season. But so far, they've been working extremely well together. And this may be an unpopular opinion, but I don't see this becoming this big intra-team rivalry everyone's talking about. Yeah, there's always that strong desire to beat your teammates, and Lewis obviously won't be thrilled about George's results being better than his, but there isn't any animosity between the two. They've simply both been focused on trying to make the most out of the situation they're currently in. If there's anything that really highlights Russell's true talent, it's a story that goes all the way back to 2014, when he was 16 years old. You see, at the time, George was competing in both the Formula Renault 2.0 Alps series and the BRDC Formula 4 Championship. He ended the Formula Renault series fourth in the standings without a single victory, behind current Ferrari driver Charles Leclerc and Formula E champion Nick de Vries. In addition to this, in the third race of the penultimate weekend in his Formula 4 campaign, Russell clashed for the second time that season with South African driver Ryle Hyman. This left him 21 points down behind championship leader Arjun Maini going into the final round at Snetterton. Given the cutthroat nature of motorsports, this championship was either going to make or break his career. He just had to win. Russell struggled for most of the season with race starts. Being one of the tallest drivers on the grid in a Formula 4 chassis that was incredibly slim, George was forced to adapt by twisting his feet and using his toes to press the pedals. As you can imagine, this wasn't the most comfortable feeling, and it caused his starts to suffer, especially at the final round when it mattered most. After starting on pole for the first race, he dropped places off the line and ended up finishing a lowly P7. Luckily for him, Maini finished one place behind and was on reverse grid pole for race 2. That went a little better for Russell, as he finished in second, with Miney down in fifth due to one costly error. But the Indian driver remained the favourite for the championship, as he still had a 13-point buffer. Now, remember how I mentioned that George was involved in a couple of race-ending retirements with Ryle Hyman? Well, for the final race, both guys lined up alongside each other on the front row. Hyman dropped the Brit at the start, meaning that Russell would have to pass him on track to win the title. And given their history, Odds were that they'd come together again. But unlike on previous occasions, Russell picked his moment perfectly and made a defining move that would win him the championship. Since then, he went on to finish third in the Formula 3 European Championship and win GP3 and Formula 2 in back-to-back -back seasons as a rookie. And the rest, well, is history. For those who doubted Russell before, hopefully this season is proof that he is a generational talent a driver with an innate ability to rapidly adapt to different conditions, scenarios, and machinery. 
He's a professional with maturity beyond his years. And there's no doubt in my mind that one day he will become a Formula One world champion. I hope you all enjoyed. If you did, please give it a like and share it around with others in the F1 community. Subscribe to the channel if you're new to keep up to date with my latest videos in the future. And as always, I'll see you in the next one.